Uh, good morning, everybody. I want to welcome everybody to our session on Gender Diversity in South Asian Management Education. We're very lucky this morning to have a number of uh, great scholars from Pakistan, from the Mormon from the United States, uh, presenting here for us today. So, including myself, Bahali Mustafa, uh, Dr. Adika Tiani, uh, and then we have uh, Dr. Bilal Kaiti, uh, Wajna Aslami, uh, Farzana Sati, uh, Kutia Batu, uh, Raja Begum, Aisha Zahid, Samira Rahman, um, Kadri Abdul Rahman, Mimuna Zareen, Kiran Fari, as well as Dr. Muhammad Ahmad. So we will give you a brief introduction about our topic and hopefully uh, that will lead to some good discussion. Uh, well, there have been many, many positive changes over the last 10 years in Afghanistan. Uh, mismanagement, perhaps the appropriate word to describe the status of policies in Afghanistan as well as education. Sadly, very little funding goes towards education in the country, and that leads to obviously uh, very little being done for training and development of faculty as well as uh, the promotion of equality and gender education. So sadly, uncertainty, distress, and chaos, or other words that perfectly describe the status of education, development, education, and the emotions of people in Afghanistan right now. In terms of numbers, in the 1980s, there were 1.2 million students, including 18% girls, in all levels and types of education in the country. However, after 20 years, at the end of the century, the total enrollment education system was less than 1 million and only 7% of them were female in the school system. So you can see there was a huge drop in females unfortunately suffering the most as a result of the chaos in the war. So during this period, the quality of education suffered and the system did not function effectively due to conflicts and wars and obviously instability and the stress that people were feeling uh, in terms of the children going to school. In 2012, the enrollment in general education was 8.6 million students, including 2.9 million females, which is about 38%. So in 2012, there have been quite a number of um, advancements or at least um, promotions to get more females into the school system. The enrollment in higher education was 110,000, including 19,200 19, female students which is 19%. There has been no significant progress in adult literacy, which basically stays stable around 30% or so. In 2012, again, a total of 18,000 students, including 892 female uh, students, were enrolled in the faculties of engineering, computer science, geology, and mining, as well as agriculture in Afghanistan. What's interesting is that in Afghanistan, distance education is not something new. Actually, it was being used all the way in the 1960s uh, for the development of uh, faculty, not just in Kabul, but outside of Kabul in remote areas. So now, um, it is being estimated that virtual education or distance education will be very helpful, especially regarding the equality of gender for uh, females. The public universities are present have been about 40,000 students in Afghanistan. However, just in 2012 alone, there were over 130,000 students graduate from secondary school. So the public universities can only admit 40,000, where would the other 90,000 students go? So obviously some of them will be admitted into private institutions, and others uh, probably go on to working, and so on. But hopefully the private institutions can uh, accommodate more students at reasonable cost in the future. In 2012, in terms of shortages, there were 3,009 male and 510 female faculty members in Afghanistan. So you can see the ratio of male to female, it, it, there's a huge gap there. About 5% of them have doctoral degree qualifications and 36% have earned master's degrees. So a majority of them only have a bachelor's degree uh, or diploma. So despite the increase in numbers, the qualification of most faculty members has not improved much over the past few decades. The most well-educated Afghans get the opportunity to travel abroad. Unfortunately, they end up staying there simply because the situation back home is not um, ideal, so then they stay abroad. So when 
faculty members are given the opportunity to do their master's degrees and PhDs abroad. Again, the brain drain continues because once they get done, they do not go back home. So the country suffers even more. Afghanistan is still a dependent society. So they depend on their neighbors, they depend on their national community. So as, as, as global um, professionals, we need to continue, obviously, to support education in Afghanistan. And the people of Afghanistan hopefully will become a valuable asset to their own country and to the region as well. Thank you very much. Today I'm going to present a little empirical analysis of the gender disparity in education and employment in Pakistan where we will see that the literacy map in Pakistan showing that the 80% of the Punjab area, they are literate, including the male and female, while the 20% are only in the southern part of the Pakistan. So if you have the quick look of the 2012 report, it shows that there's a big gap between the male and female education, and that is the 79% and 61% for male and female. Similarly, in India, the rest of the countries have a little gap between education uh, for the male and female. In Pakistan, the gender discrepancy in education is extremely very high. From the last few years, male literacy rate increased by 59% to 65%, while the female literacy increased only 32% to 42%, though it improves, but still there is a need to improve it better. So the gap is still between 23% male female literacy ratio, and during the 2008, the literacy rate of the males was 68.2 and the females was 43.6%. But during 2008, only 21.8% of the women had opportunities to participate in the labor force, although 82.7% of the males were engaged in employment. So it's a big gap between the employment opportunities for the male and the female. So the labor force survey shows that 6.5 out of 47 million employed females, which becomes 9 million women out of from 70% were employed in the agriculture sector because Pakistan is basically an agriculture sector and most of the female uh, are working in the agriculture sector. For including all this in briefly, we can say that we, I myself try to uh, test the hypothesis that whether there is gender differential in education and employment having a negative effect on the GDP growth, on investment growth, on population growth, and on labor force participation. So I've tested these four now hypotheses by employing the simultaneous equation where we have used the general matter of movement GM technique. So this is the brief summary of the variables which I have used by using the growth rates of all the GDP and invest for investment we have used the growth the gross fixed capital formation, the population growth, the labor force participation starting from the age 14 to 60 years. And in order to see the human capital effect on, on education, uh, on uh, growth, we have used the three different uh, categories that the female male ratio at professional colleges, at science and art colleges, and at university level. We also see the import and export effect and interest rate effect on growth rate. So we can say that uh, there is a big gap between the education and the growth rate. If we want to improve our growth rate, it's better to emphasize more on the women education and also the our rural sector improvement. And for the labor for participation, we should provide the motivation and the different incentive for the rural women, not only in the agriculture sector, but many other sectors to to do the work and provide the different opportunities to them to improve the growth rate and fixed capital formation as well. So it's a, the brief implication is that in the presence of the higher regional gender gap in Pakistan, public spending on the rural areas and female education will play a remarkable role as compared to urban areas. Usually women take less interest in corruption like services, so they should encourage government services which will definitely have better impact on economic growth. Government should also provide maximum education facilities, particularly technical and vocational education to women so they are involved with the skills which not only help them to increase the GDP growth, but also the standard of their own living may improve. Thank you so much.
I want to discuss about different styles of leadership and their impact on employee motivation. Leadership is about making others better as a result of your presence and making sure that impact lasts in your absence. In organizations, it is a behavior which managers exhibit to motivate their subordinates for the development of their capabilities. Well, value of motivated employees cannot be violated for any organization as they become the competitive advantage in the long run with high degree of organizational commitment and job engagement. In this context, it is very important for the managers to know about various leadership styles and their impact on motivation so they may choose the most appropriate leadership style to achieve organizational commitment of employees to accomplish individual as well as organizational goals. The research question of this study is, do leadership styles have an impact on employee motivation and what is the impact of transactional transformational and less few leadership styles on employee motivation. The study has been conducted in Pakistan, quantitative study, and the primary data has been collected. Findings are verified with statistical analysis, Pearson's correlation has been used, and regression analysis has been used. Pearson correlation shows that all three leadership styles have a positive impact on employee motivation. Why? Transformational style of leadership is more useful on higher management levels and transactional style of leadership is more useful on lower management levels. And laissez fair leadership style is more useful within the teams. It also has been found that female leaders mostly use transformational style of leadership and female followers get motivated more with the same transformational style of leadership and they come up with more positive outcomes. Why? Male leaders mostly use the transactional or laissez fair leadership styles. In the light of this study, managers may choose the more appropriate leadership style according to the nature of the work and capabilities and willingness of the employees to do the work. We may conclude this discussion with the words that all three leadership styles have a positive impact on employee motivation. Education is important, but uh, we, we do edu education from different sources. And in the past, what we have done is uh, we have given education based on our roles. But the world is changing, and economic uh, you know, situation is changing, and more and more we are saying globalization. And with these changes, we need to think about uh, gender equality in India and other South Asian countries. Uh, the question is, is gender equality uh, exists all over the world? Answer is yes. If you look at several Western countries in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, there was uh, gender inequality. With economic development, we have seen change in gender inequality in education in the West. With the change in economic development in India, we will see change in gender inequality in education. The question is why we are concerned about gender inequality in education. It is because of four reasons. Personal growth, knowledge-based economy, global disparity, freedom of expression. Personal growth. In a civilized society, we would like personal growth of both male and female. Knowledge-based economy. In a knowledge-based economy, competition is based on knowledge and both male and female could contribute to the knowledge-based economy. Global disparity. People all around the world are concerned with glo global disparity and it can be eliminated by reducing gender inequality in education. Freedom of expression. Every human being should have the right to express himself or herself and freedom of expression brings prosperity. Based on my research, I believe that gender inequality could be studied by understanding the factors that contribute to inequality. The factors that contribute to gender inequality in education are culture, religion, economy, politics, social structure, educational opportunities, technology, and globalization. Culture. Culture sometimes restricts educational opportunities for women based on the gender role in the family. Religion. Religion and religious leaders plays an important role in defining gender role and it turns results in gender inequality in education. Economy. A growing economy creates opportunities for both male and female education and on the other hand, a weak economy increases the inequality in education. Politics. Male-dominant politics of South 
East Asia is an obstacle to improving gender inequality in education. Social structure. Extended family structure is a good social structure, but breeds gender inequality in education because of the interdependency. Educational opportunities. Incentives from both government and educational institution may provide opportunities for female education and reduce gender inequality in education. Technology. Technology provides opportunities for females to access education services without disturbing the gender role in the family. Globalization. Globalization brings economic opportunities and social awareness, and that will lead to gender equality. Recommendations. To bring equality in gender education in Southeast Asia, we need to offer monetary incentives for females to pursue education. Support the growth of private schools. Provide gender education for male learners. Train faculty to treat both male and female learners equally. And promote competitive culture for education. Thank you.